Hi everyone, I'm John Idell from Westmead Hospital in the University of Sydney. Welcome to this session on COVID-19 and the causative agent, SARS coronavirus 2. I'm an infectious diseases physician and clinical microbiologist. Um, I'm based at the State Referral Centre for High Consequence Pathogens in Australia's largest city. My salary and funding is from the uh, federal government and the state government. Um, although I have had some industry sponsored investigator initiated grants, which I've listed there by way of declaration. The first time we saw a major respiratory virus pandemic in recent times in the context of a completely absent herd immunity was the swine flu pandemic, which emerged in Mexico after a combination of anti influenza A, H1N1 arriving as a winter pandemic uh, as a winter epidemic in the southern hemisphere and we particularly saw pregnant women um, and obesity as major risk factors it really stressed our intensive care unit uh, structures in this country as it did in many others um, and we did learn of the value really of extracorporeal membrane oxygenation so-called ECMO as uh, a valuable bridging maneuver. Age adjusted mortality in influenza, you can see reflecting the lack of maternal antibodies in the population with uh, a very high impact on the very young. And about 13% of all swine flu deaths in this country were pregnant women. COVID does not appear to have this same impact. You can see that there were no ICU admissions or deaths amongst 170,000 cases analysed from a recent US publication in the under 19s. And the worst outcomes were by far and away in the elderly. When compared to the other coronaviruses, you can see that SARS-CoV-2 has a relatively lower mortality the attributed mortality to MERS is about one in three. And for the original SARS in 2003, about 10%. They have in common droplet transmission and probably GI transmission. The important point to make is probably that SARS-CoV-2 is rather more transmissible, transmissible in much the same way that influenza is. That is to say, there's at least two people infected further by every case. Whereas with MERS, we had less than one, so it's not really as sustainable as an epidemic. They're all enveloped RNA viruses, but the COVID genomes are much more stable than that of flu A. The SARS and the MERS viruses tend to attack ACE2 receptors, which are present in respiratory epithelium and in the GI tract. Um, but there's no evidence that stopping ACE inhibitors is of value and it may actually do some harm. As you well know, this started in Western China in late 2019 and spread to become a global pandemic, now infecting, well, nearly three and a half million and rising with about a quarter of a million deaths attributable. The curve is starting to flatten and it varies from country to country, but those countries most hit are those countries most connected, it's fair to say. So in the Northern Hemisphere, obviously the US is hardest hit and is still experiencing the worst of it at the moment. Some countries have managed to flatten things out a little earlier. Uh, we were one of the lucky few, I guess, as an island nation. Um, South Korea as well, Taiwan, you can see. Uh, what worries many people is that we've yet to see what's going to happen in Africa and uh, that may be, um, it may be that there will be quite an impact. Where did this come from? We know that bats like the eastern horseshoe bat shown here and present in markets contains coronaviruses. And we know that the pangolin, the most trafficked mammal in the world, is um, can has been found to harbour a coronavirus that is almost identical to SARS-CoV-2, hence the slightly whimsical 
title of the piece in the New York Times. If you examine the viral genomes, you can see clearly here we have all the coronaviruses uh, that have been part of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Here is the 2003 coronaviruses. Here's MERS from 2012. And here are all the bat coronaviruses. You can see they're closely related. This was from the very early days of the pandemic. Important point to make is that the coronaviruses are not recombinant like influenza, and but they do have enough variants to be usefully tracked by genome sequencing. As lipid enveloped RNA viruses, their alcohol oxidant, that's chlorine bleach, and detergent sensitive. So all the things that you would normally use are fine. They are, as I said, very different <clears throat> genomically. Um, and the outer membrane proteins are quite different. COVID appears to be a more inflammatory disease than influenza. This is important because of the implications for pregnancy, um, which does not appear to be a risk factor. Uh, for neonates, who do not appear to be particularly vulnerable, and also for the role of ECMO as a bridging therapy, because clearly if people who progress to lung disease get extremely destructive disease, then ECMO has much less value, uh, except as a bridge to transplantation and the role of all this is unclear at the moment. But it may also mean that anti-inflammatory drugs uh, have particular value. This is a cartoon of the phases of illness, starting with the viral response, beyond which we may see no progression in, in the young and fit. Some people present with very little in the way of symptoms. Those who do have severe symptoms may potentially benefit from antiviral drugs. There's some signal coming from remdesivir uh, that remains to be seen. It may turn out to be similar to the value of oseltamivir in influenza, which is significant but not um, not enormous. Uh, the initial enthusiasm of hydroxychloroquine I think has proven unjustified. Convalescent plasma is unlikely to be valuable but because the disease when it does progress progresses at the point of shortness of breath where you would see changes on high resolution images such as CT and eventually on chest x-ray to severe lung disease then the anti-inflammatory drugs may have a role. This is not clear at the moment, but drugs like tocilizumab is part of a um, platform, an adaptive platform trial uh, currently going worldwide to understand different types of therapies. This is a depiction of aerosolization and the rationale for social distancing. Heavy wet droplets with high virus loads inside them rain out fairly quickly due to weight and they can settle on surfaces where lipid envelope viruses will tolerate several hours at room temperature. Smaller droplets generated during breathing, for example, just in the normal course of uh, your activities, dry out faster in the first fraction of a second and become a small droplet nuclei that hang. If you do a procedure that generates a lot of very small particles, so-called aerosolization procedure, then you can expect a greater density of droplet nuclei. And that is why you need, ideally, a mask that is fitted around your face and through, through which you draw air directly through the mask rather than around the sides in a surgical mask. And this is why there are distinctions between the masks that are chosen uh, for different types of circumstances. The impact of public health policy is well illustrated by the difference in mortality costs of quick enacting of social distancing in St. Louis within a couple of days and slower, nearly three weeks, in Philadelphia during the 1918 pandemic. In the case of COVID-19, this study in Iceland illustrates the relative impact of migration 
versus local spread. This is a country of 360,000 people, of which about a third live in the capital city. And they moved fairly quickly to manage public health policy. And you can see the impact of the purple bars falling down within a matter of weeks. This is the incoming uh, pandemic virus. And then the grey and particularly the orange spread inside families, so social spread developing thereafter. And you can see here in the bottom graph how small the curve attributable purely to migration would have been compared to the secondary curve that you can see taking off. And you can see clearly that failure to manage this would have a huge outcome. Hand washing is something that we need to emphasise. This has been something we all know that uh, clinicians don't do as well as they should. We know that the impact of hand washing uh, can be potentially enormous and it was modelled nicely in the context of a respiratory virus epidemic in a collaboration between BBC and Cambridge, I think a year or two ago in fact, in which uh, it was almost prescient really because it's a nice analogy for what's happening now. They showed that their models predicted huge impact in terms of ultimate infection rate in the country just from extra hand washing five or ten times a day. So this is normal clinical hand washing, just doing it properly. Should you wear a face mask? Experts disagree because on one side, there's no doubt that a well-fitted face mask gives you some protection. But we know that people who are not used to using them use them badly. They stick their fingers in their eyes. They don't handle all the rest of the risk factors properly. And it gives them a false sense of security. So it's potentially quite dangerous. So on top of that, with the using of uh, PPE in short supply, many places recommend not to use it for asymptomatic people in the public. Healthcare workers, the story is probably a little different. We know that uh, we've been losing healthcare workers in this outbreak. Um, tragically, we've lost dozens, maybe hundreds of healthcare workers already. And estimates are that up to half of this loss may be due to work exposures. It's very hard to sort this kind of thing out, but um, that's probably an accurate figure. It's a range of estimates, but they're converging on similar kinds of numbers. So how do you protect yourself at work? The recommendations from the NHS are these on the left, and I think that's a nice cartoon, which is why I put it up. Our recommendations here in Australia are the same, and the CD recommendations are much the same as well. One of the areas that people differ on is the type of face and eye protection. Everybody's got gloves, everybody's got an impervious gown of some sort. The distinctions that are made are normally between the general contact with a COVID case and aerosol generating procedures such as an intubation or a nasopharyngeal swab or that sort of thing. It would just recommend that you use eyewear to keep the droplets out of the mucosa, which can be an important source of infection. And uh, the masks, many people are recommending using a N2 or uh, sorry, an N95 or a, a P2 or as the in the English system, an FFP three type um, face mask, which needs to be fitted around the nose so that airflow comes through the front rather than around the sides of the mask, because it often doesn't a surgical mask. Um, putting on your PPE properly and more importantly, taking it off properly is really important. And that's where people get into trouble. So it's sometimes helpful to watch videos. And the Australian Clinical Excellence Commission has a lot of little two minute videos on where the traps are for healthcare workers. And if you want to look at those. So this shows the types of face masks that are widely used. The plain surgical face mask is not fitted, unlike the N95 or P2 mask, in which it's important to make sure that you're breathing directly through the mask and not around the sides of the mask. The N99 particle filter with a little HEPA membrane in the middle 
um, is not widely used. The PAPA or the powered airway respirator is very comfortable, but you need training to use it safely. I'll come back to that because clumsy use of PPE is a source of contamination. Eyewear is important. Goggles or a face shield is usually recommended. In, un, incorrect PPE use is very common. That's really the problem. If you don't use it properly, you don't protect yourself or your colleagues. And the more complex the PPE you choose, the more likely it will be misused. If you choose a, a PAPA respirator and a very sophisticated PPE, you might have very like high level protection, but when you take it off, you are much more likely to contaminate yourself. And studies of healthcare workers use of PPE have shown that self-contamination is very common indeed. So we ensure that high level PPE such as for VA, VHFs is always supervised, um, not only the putting on, but particularly the taking off because that's the dangerous part. And this uh, is one of the reasons why we recommend simple PPE that is used for a variety of different circumstances. What about testing? <clears throat> There's no doubt that the upper tract and the lower tract have different yields at different phases of the illness. We learnt from influenza that severe disease on life support is much more likely to be positive when a deep lower tract sample is taken, whereas when first presenting with a wet face, the upper tract is the specimen of choice. That's common sense to some extent, but it's reinforced by data from COVID, which shows that bronchial villavage is a reliable specimen of a ventilated patient, more so than sputum, which can sometimes be a poor specimen. You know, obviously, if it's peas and carrots, it's not going to be a good test. Nasal swabs, well taken, are very useful, nasopharyngeal swabs. Faeces is not reliable as a specimen, but it does contain virus sometimes, and viremia is very rarely captured. The phase of illness is important. Prolonged shedding does occur, um, but the PCR will often continue positive past the stage of culture positivity and probably past the stage of infectivity. We certainly learnt this with influenza, although this has not absolutely been proven for COVID at the moment. The concept of the super spreader um, has often been discussed. It may be behavioural more than physiological. And this little point here is important. Pre-testing is misleading in that if you routinely test asymptomatic patients, you will falsely uh, reassure yourself about people who are incubating and it's generally not recommended. You should test symptomatic people and attention to symptomatic screening is what should be emphasized. Serology is useful, but it's post hoc, of course, and culture, I think I mentioned when do we test? We should be testing individuals as indicated by their symptoms um, and using a properly collected PCR. And that properly collected uh, is emphasised because it's better to have trained people doing this. Poor collection leads to false negatives. Population-based screening is for totally different purposes and shouldn't be used to guide clinical screening. So to summarise, this is a respiratory infection that is dominated by droplet spread. So that means airway precautions are important. If you're doing high risk procedures, likely to generate lots of small um, inhalable droplets, then we recommend a fitted N95 or P2 mask. PAPA is very comfortable if you know how to use it, but if you don't know how to use it, you may infect yourself. This may be a more inflammatory disease, so the role of anti-inflammatories is important. Pregnancy is probably not a risk. Unsurprisingly, in children are less symptomatic and may not be very important vectors of disease. So how do you manage your clinic? You should be doing it with active screening, asking people, do you have a fever? Do you have relevant symptoms? By using simple social distancing, telemedicine, and as I said, PPE. Very important, face and hands. I think I'll stop there and thanks for your attention.